Hi, I'm Othias, and this is Webley's number five new model, Army Express, a triple action solid frame revolver, which represents a distinct and deliberate step backwards in technology. Why? Well, we'll cover that after we get a closer look in the light box. With an overall length of 11 inches, this is a fairly hefty revolver at 2.4 pounds. That is, of course, because it is a solid and rugged military design. Loading is accomplished through the right hand gate, accepting six rounds singularly. The chambering may be 450 Adams, 455 Enfield Mark II, or 476, which stands for the Enfield Mark III cartridge. Ejection is singular using the fixed rod. Since nobody makes these new, or anything we cover new, uh, we can't really shill very easily, and therefore we must rely on you, the viewer, in order to create our unbiased, in-depth exploration of historical firearms. So, if you have a moment and you would like this show to continue, please, please take a look for us over on Patreon, or what Utreon has now been renamed to being Player, which sounds both dirty and French. Congratulations. Now, of course, I do get to uh, sell one product that we actually were using well before they paid us. It was a favorite of mine. I'm very happy that this works out for our show. But some of our funds come from Ballastol. And in our last Ballastol mini-sode, I mentioned two features of the oil which were uniquely impressive on its adoption by the German army. The first was that it was water-soluble, and while I've mentioned it before, I should definitely reiterate today, to the army, the fact that it remained effective even when wet was enough, right? That's that's great. But for shooters today, especially those interested in, say, black powder firearms, this is the root of moose milk, a mixture of ballastol and water, usually somewhere around one part to three for cleaning or less for storage. Diluted ballastol does a lovely job of washing away fouling and leaving a preservative light coat of oil. Mix your own and give it a shot. I've certainly been using it on every episode that you see involving black powder firearms. Oh look, I have a black powder firearm right here. I bet you'd like to hear more about it. Thankfully, we've already covered just about every firearm we would need to put this in the proper context. But how about a quick refresher? In the early 1870s, Britain adopted a string of centerfire Adams revolvers culminating in the Mark III. These were gate-loading, rod-ejecting, triple-action wheel guns. They were chambered for 450 Adams, a cartridge that evolved from the need to convert existing percussion revolvers. Unfortunately, this was a rather weak option for a martial handgun. Still, Britain's first military centerfire handgun cartridge spawned an entire market of commercially produced revolvers largely coming out of the arms-making town of Birmingham. And in this period of technological advancement where breech loading was king, the old names and firearms kind of gave way to the new. One of these was Philip Webley who had long toiled with his own privately owned shop, but was more recently making a great many sales thanks to his targeting the police revolver market. Taking what was then a fairly common triple action rimfire or early centerfire revolver, Webley managed to secure contracts one after another for police forces around the empire. He and his sons would continue to improve their product, ultimately becoming the king of the British Bulldog, at least in terms of reputation, if not outright sales. These little RIC revolvers were slightly larger than a pocket model, but still much handier than the big Adams. They were far better suited to the little 450 cartridge. However, they were geared to the civilian market. Police service was as rough as they got, at least by design at that time. The military would demand something much, much more rugged. Now, just to be clear, at this point, the Adams was largely a naval revolver. The British Army dickered about revolvers so much that the official handgun remained a single-shot percussion pistol all the way into the latter 1870s. It wasn't until late 1877 that the Army approved use of the Navy's Adams revolvers, with them finally coming into official adoption in early 1878. This began a series of cascading debates and ultimately decisions. Within just two years, it was decided that far more men in the Army were going to be issued handguns, specifically revolvers, than before and that the 450 Adams cartridge, along with the ungainly, basically, conversion revolver, was not going to cut it. Unfortunately for the army, there were both too many and too few options to choose from. The market was flooded with unique mechanisms, mostly designed in Belgium and manufactured by hand in Liège or Birmingham. These were usually civilian-oriented, weak in power and weak in construction. 
On the other hand, the US market did provide high-powered solutions, chambering cartridges like 44 Smith & Wesson Russian or the adopted 45 Colt. Unfortunately, the US firearms were too delicate for British colonial service. And they were, from the British perspective, often obsolete single action only. The British Army's concerns weren't exactly a secret. The Birmingham gunsmiths, being uh, probed for options, realized that there would soon be a replacement coming for the Adams. This spawned another wave of new designs in the market, attempting to capture the Army's eye. The first of these were actually fairly conservative, both in design and expense to the manufacturer. Take a police pistol, bulk it up, call it a day. They didn't make it very far, though. Competition escalated significantly when Colt's patent firearms attempted to take the market. Guided by their ever-informed agent Von Oppen, Colt's had finally come around to the idea of a triple-action revolver, creating the model of 1878 specifically to interest the British. We have a whole episode out on just how that came about, but the short story is that the Colt was somewhat lacking and ultimately failed to tempt adoption. However, at the time, it appeared this was no foregone conclusion. The idea that the US giant might overtake the Birmingham gunsmiths drove a flurry of direct competition. We saw the preeminent William Tranter's response in one of our earlier episodes, his own model of 1878, machine made to be interchangeable in its parts, at his new Aston Cross factory. Curiously, this handgun was contracted for, albeit as an act of desperation. Thanks to the fallout from the Russo-Turkish War, Britain felt the need to mobilize and better equip their army. This wasn't for an active conflict, but instead was meant to show force and be prepared to follow through if the bluff was called. This created a sudden demand for revolvers that was far too great for the waning Adams firm to keep up. So commercial solutions were taken up. Small numbers of Colt 1878s, a larger sum of Tranter 1878s, and just a smidge of Tranter 1868s were purchased for immediate service. None, however, were found acceptable enough to remain as the official sidearm of the Empire. Like Tranter, Webley would also respond to the Colt 1878. Big hint, it would result in the number 5, but take note of that designation, number 5. That means it was preceded by the number 4. Webley's attention was first turned towards a more feature-rich revolver a top-break, self-extracting model with a rebounding hammer. Webley's number four would spark a series of improved top breaks that ultimately led to the creation and adoption of the Mark I service revolver. But that wouldn't come along until nearly a decade later. The number four was, by the way, a good gamble. Tranter, frankly, had the same notion. He floated his own Model 1879 top break, which again, we've thankfully covered before. Both Webley and Tranter, however, lost out to, well, complete insanity from the War Department. The Enfield Mark I was ultimately adopted for service at about the time everyone was scrambling to compete. We've actually covered this bizarre chimera before, a marriage of English styling, American extraction, and Belgian lockwork. The new service revolver came with new ammunition. The Enfield Mark II cartridge, which was a compromise between the weak 450 Adams and the freight-trained 45 Colt cartridge as adopted in the US, and advocated for by some British officers. Plenty of these same men were against the notion of a fancy-schmancy modern revolver, and the Enfield didn't do a lot to quell their fears at all. There was a lot of support for sticking with a gate loader, and since officers purchased their own sidearms, so long as they were in the government cartridge, mind you, there would be a market for solid-frame gate-loading revolvers. So just like Tranter's direct response to Colt, Webley adapted their own RIC line to concoct the number 5. Now, unfortunately, I do not have an original version of the number no. 5 Webley here today, what you might call an old model. This is the new model, like I said. Uh, those were made in limited numbers for reasons we're about to cover. To be honest, the original number no. 5 versus the one I have here today are about as far apart as this in the RIC in some ways. Anyway, thanks to some images on loan from Rock Island Auction, I can give you a quick once over. At first glance, you might think the original number no. 5 is just a beefy, longer-barreled RIC number no. 1 with a Colt-style fixed ejector rod bolted on its right-hand side. And you'd be almost correct. However, because that big ejector is there, we have no need for the Adam-style ejector from the number no. 1. It was too slow and too flimsy for combat reloads anyway. This is a Webley RIC number no. 3, essentially a stripped-down model with a separate ejector screwed into the heel if present at all. Because the Adams ejector held the arbor in place, this model uses a Tranter-like latch set in the left side of the frame, spring-loaded to lock the arbor. 
The same mechanism was carried over to the original number 5. Because the Atom's ejector system also served to provide drag on the arbor, making it a sprag against counter-rotation when the trigger is released, the number 5 had to be fitted with, well, that or, in this case, a locking bolt. Strangely, this seems to have been fairly close to the Price patent locking bolt, which in my eye makes this Webley, the number 5, much closer to the Price than the supposed number 4 Price. Outside of the extra locking bolt, the lock work is the same as the RIC number 1, a triple action design using a sear for single action and an L-shaped strut for double, however there was a change. The hammer rebound system from the number 4 was apparently brought over as well. This was of course based on a much earlier Stanton patent, with the lower arm of the mainspring acting directly on the hammer. Curiously, this example, sold through Rock Island, doesn't seem to have its hammer rebounded. I'm sorry to say I haven't managed to handle it in order to confirm just why. Now all of this would certainly be enough to catch up to the Tranter 1878, which didn't even have an automatic rebound, but Webley actually took it a step further. They incorporated Michael Kaufman's 1881 patent for a hammer block safety made from an extension on the gate. At least, they said they did. Opening the revolver to load would prevent the lock work from operating. This was actually developed to solve problems with the Enfield Mark I revolver, hence the drawing. However, asking around for people who have handled this gun, that block doesn't just block the lock work. Instead, it's been modified to disconnect the trigger from the hammer an abity disconnect, meaning that with the gate open, the trigger could be pulled to index the cylinder for loading and unloading without tipping the hammer. Unfortunately, I've been unable to see this operation myself, and it goes beyond the cited patent. Regardless of that, I should also point out that Kaufman and the gun itself should prevent the gate from being opened if the hammer is already cocked back, another safety feature. Returning to some of the holdover features from the RIC line, the 6 inch long barrel is still in the RIC number 1's classic ovate shape, a sort of teardrop. The grip is the same as the RIC, a one piece affair that frankly makes up the rear of the gun. Again, while I don't have the early number 5 here, I do have an RIC made the same way, so let me show you what I mean about that grip. If you watch our channel, you already know the RIC number one. All we care about is the grip, which in this case, thankfully, is identical to what was used on what was the early number five. This is a single piece grip. I've gone ahead and removed the screws. And as you can see, it just wraps around the back of the gun. Now in military service, this represents a number of problems. First and foremost, it's kind of delicate in the sense that if you drop this on the back, you have a fairly good chance of developing a crack down the seam. And if you do, this is a fairly complicated shape to uh, jig up for and hand fit to this guy. This is not really military easy, right? On the frame side, we have additional problems, which is that all of this area at the rear is entirely unsupported, which puts a lot of pressure here in the case of repeated handling and especially dropping or even slugging somebody with the thing, right? You know, and I know, that soldiers do weird things with guns. How many times have you seen them all beat up on the bottom being used as a hammer to drive a nail? That's going to put a lot of force right here where you don't want it. So ultimately, this is a fairly weak military setup, and yet it was used by Webley in their first number five because, well, they were already doing it. I'm sure they were already jigged up. This is easy for them. This is what they've been doing. Webley chose to name their new number five revolver the Army Express. That term express is deeply confusing in this context. In the modern world, the term express in firearms largely refers to high velocity large bore ammunition. Typically, typically it's associated with big game hunting. And hunting is likely where the slow morph came from because long ago, in the 1870s let's say, express largely meant a high velocity cartridge using a lighter bullet, usually small bore. That's because in the 1870s, small bore was unusual. Period accounts often associate express with expanding ammunition, i.e. hollow points. Because express came to mean powerful, it appears Webley felt it would make for good marketing. And I can't deny, while it makes no sense, I do kind of like the name, Army Express. Anyway, this new number 5 would be extremely short-lived, replaced before the summer of 1881. To be honest, they probably only produced one initial batch of this design. I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone by saying that it was superseded 
by this model right here, which was marketed as the new model Army Express. While I have no documentation as to exactly why changes were made, they seem to suggest two concerns were afoot. Strength and simplicity. Let me actually show you both. All right, we have our number five military revolver. And just for comparison, let me give you a quick glimpse of, well, I still haven't put the screws back in that grip, but you get the idea. This is much larger than the RAC number one. And if they look, you know, fairly square in size, let me tell you, the weight here is uh, way different. This is nearly two and a half pounds. Let me get this little guy out of the way. Now, the number five, new model in this case, very specifically, is a ruggedized and simplified version of the ruggedized and somewhat complexified number five old model. How does it differ? Well, let's take a quick look. Number one, the ovate barrel is gone, replaced with something more akin to what we saw in the number four uh, Webley Kone style of revolver. We have a rib, we're squared up, the frame is milled off flush, very squared up. This is very simple, honestly, in terms of construction and the uh, angles that you're seeing. We also have a, well, let's go back to the rudimentaries. We have a single, ooh, boom, and double action military revolver. For its time period, this already puts it ahead of a lot of what we saw in the US, but this is England, obviously. They like triple actions at this point. Now, the grip really stands out because it is now two piece instead of one piece. We have the regular stock plates that we're so accustomed to on either side, much easier to manufacture and fit to the gun in case of needing replaced and harder to break. The frame wraps all the way around. Uh, you know what? It's not just there, it's extremely thick, almost as thick as my finger. This is very stout. The grip itself is what you call saw handle or bird's head. Uh, the saw handle part is especially because of the fact that we have a knuckle and then it swoops on down in here into what people tend to call a bird's head, which is that we have a soft back, easy on uh, the clothing, easy in the holster, and yet a nice sharp pronouncement here, which helps us get that lower finger shed on there and really draw it from the holster. Also providing good stable shooting when we're firing. This is actually a lovely piece of hardware and it's a little bit of a departure from what Webley was used to at this point, which was more of that square square back, you know, flat bottom grip that we saw on, well, the old RICs last episode, and of course on the old model number five. This is fairly new. The five and a half inch barrel is half an inch shorter than the previous old model number five, and the sights are zeroed for 25 yards. At least that's what I was told they were at the factory. On the other side, you can see that we're dealing with a gate loader. And if you're not careful, you could damage your firing pin. See the stop in there? That's because the hammer is no longer auto rebounding. That feature was dropped for a manual. Uh, now that we can rotate free, you can see that we can load each of our cartridges one by one. Unfortunately, the roll back to a line that you see on a lot of British revolvers is not present in this one. Rolling back to where the hand intersects the back teeth of the cylinder just lines up with a little bit of no, there's no way to get in there. You have to manually index very carefully for each one. The Abity system that was on the old model is completely gone. So if I pull the trigger, that hammer does indeed move. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't even have the hammer block safety like the Kaufman patent. This has ditched every little extra in terms of saving money. Now, if I line this guy up, you can see that we have our ejector rod, which springs forward. This apparently was not cleaned in any significant way by Colt at the time, so they were able to walk away with that with no problem. Uh, on the other two features, by the way, while I'm on this side of the gun, the lack of rebound, the lack of hammer block, I'm concerned that Webley might have been dodging patents or it might have been saving costs. I don't know which. Uh, in theory, the Stanton patent might have been enforceable against the rebounding hammer. And certainly if this was doing an Abity system of cutting off the hammer instead of just hard locking it like the Kaufman, they may have been in violation of the Abity patents. So who knows at this point. Another change comes at the front of the gun. We can see it more clearly with the Arbor release, which is no longer a Tranter looking uh, lever on the side with its own separate spring. It's been simplified down to one part, sharing the same hole as the arbor. That's actually a nice simplification. This would almost be considered an innovation, except for the fact that it does do away with some useful features. As you saw me shifting the gun, you might've noticed the cylinder is free to spin 
even at rest, there is no locking bolt in this system anymore that was ditched from the old model. Instead, uh, we do have to have some sort of system to resist counter rotation when the trigger is released. That again comes from this same spring on the arbor. Let me pop this out. At the front, you can see, yep, we've got our notch for biasing into the frame and holding it in place. And if we keep retracting this, we'll see at the rear, we have another raised pip. I don't know if you guys can make that out. There's the spring, it goes all the way down. This one spring not only holds it in place, but also puts pressure on the inside of the cylinder. This is a friction sprag. So that's what prevents the counter rotation under the weight of let's say an unfired cartridge versus a fired one that wants to drag down with the hand when you release the trigger. That's kind of a mechanical step backwards, but it is a lot simpler to produce and service in the field. With the arbor out, we can free our cylinder. And at the front of the cylinder, we can see that Webley actually took a page out of Colt's book and put <laughs> a little bushing inside of there. We have a cylinder within the cylinder. Now, if you're wondering why, well, this is because of rust, dirt, fouling, friction, unwanted friction. What you don't want is the gun tying up or becoming too heavy to really use in double action because all of that black powder that you've been pushing out of it, because that's the area we're in, has tied up your action, right? This little guy means that you have to have the gun fail along two surfaces in order to stop running. The arbor, which rides inside of here, must freeze to in relation to this little bushing, and the bushing itself must freeze in relation to the cylinder. Both things have to happen. And the bushing, by the way, has a little collar on it to really help prevent that. Now, you might notice that this guy is not, I'm not sure where my focal plane is, is not the full length of the cylinder. That's because of the sprag situation. Remember, we want friction, except it's friction that we control. So this little spring point right here needs to be able to bias just a bit on the inside of the cylinder. If that little bushing were the full length of the cylinder, we would bias against the bushing, but free spin otherwise and have problems. So when the sprag's inserted, this guy, this little spring here, lines up with the back little quarter of the cylinder, which is actually where we've press fit in our notches for our ratchet system for indexing the cylinder. That collar is what's holding on and providing friction. That is our sprag. Now this is a solid, solid frame gun. There is no side plate. You must fish parts in and out of it like a maniac through the hole at the bottom where the trigger guard is, or maybe out where the hammer is. Looking at the side, uh, since we can't really take it apart that way very easily, we can make an educated guess about how it works because we have one, two, three screws, hammer, trigger, and sear. This uses at the very least a single action sear. We can even see it sticking out right there. Now, aside from the rebounding hammer, which again, like the number four from last episode, is just the lower mainspring's arm resting on a hammer extension, this is the same lock work as that little RIC, so there's no need to go into an animation segment when we've covered that before. Instead, we can hand this straight over to May for a demonstration.
You know, some of the most sensible firearms are the most boring in operation. No razzle-dazzle, but it certainly keeps uh, the holes close together. The new model number five was sold for two pounds, 12 shillings blued, or two pounds, 17 shillings for nickel plating. This was a popular option as it resisted rust and fouling much better than plain blue. Too bad it's so much harder to restore 100 plus years later on. It's possible, by the way, to find number five new models with other makers' marks besides Webley. Most notably, Cogswell and Harrison retailed them under the Veni Vidi Vici trademark. The number five was most commonly chambered for 450 Adams, 455 for the Enfield Mark II cartridge, and what's known as 476, which was in reference to the Enfield Mark III cartridge. Quite often the same chambering would accept the 45 Colt cartridge, and the revolvers should be rated for it loaded with black powder. Given the love some had for the American powerhouse, this was likely a best of both worlds option. Examples have also turned up chambered for 3840, 4440, and 44 Russian. Generally, the chambering is marked on the right side of the frame ahead of the cylinder, or on the left side slightly higher, or both with different markings. These might be marked for just 450, 455, 476, or 455 and 45 long, a reference to Colt. Or, like some examples, 476 on the right side and 455 and 45 long on the left, covering all the bases. Mine isn't marked at all, at least anymore. There's a faint hint. Um, I just put my money on 455 for filming, but man, 45 gold actually fits in there perfectly. Bit too rare for that pressure test though. Total production is hard to estimate because the serial numbers are confusing. The old model ranged between 77 and 87,000, a range obviously shared with other revolvers. The new model seems to have started over at number one and progressed into the 95,000 range. There are significant gaps in there though, and these firearms are rare enough that they were likely a slow seller, so probably a lot of intermixing with uh, batches of other Webley models. Confusingly, the old models are usually marked for 450 and 455, but the early new models were just marked 450. Another Webley mystery to be unpacked someday, along with this, an unusual variant that has turned up in small numbers. A number five with an Adam style tuck away ejector rod taken from the RIC number one. Some few were also sold with an optional manual safety in the form of a Fletcher and Silver uh, firing pin retractor. This was patented in 1884. I actually happen to have a constabulary type here fitted with this unusual device, so let's squeeze in a peek. Now this guy's fitted to an RIC number one, but it doesn't change the way it works if we had seen it on the number five. This little guy is actually fairly simple in operation. In its current position, the gun is ready to fire. As a matter of fact, I have the hammer cocked back. In this position, the gun is on safe and cannot be fired because the firing pin cannot reach a primer. Just to show that again, that's where the firing pin is now. That's where the firing pin ends up. I have not moved my finger. Hmm. This is actually one of the simplest mechanical safeties I have ever seen, and yet surprisingly effective. Now, the Army and Navy CSL catalog stopped listing the number five new model Army Express in late 1890, though it did appear in other catalogs for a few more years. It was later displaced by the number five Express Pocket Revolver, a civilian-oriented offering along the lines of the RIC 1883. This was most commonly chambered in the 360 cartridge. This is a distinct model from the Army Express and isn't really our topic today. So, what about military service for, well, this new model Army Express? Well, actually, unlike the number four top break, we have a fair few indications that guns like this one saw actually fairly heavy usage by soldiers and police forces inside the Empire and outside the Empire, which ended up in the Empire again as well, apparently. That's because the biggest purchasers of the number five were in Southern Africa. Webley's own advertising starting in 1884 declared that the number five new model army had been adopted by the Transvaal government. This was the Zuid Afrikanische Republic, which existed independently between the Boer Wars. While I don't know of any primary documents positively identifying the number five for service in that country, other sources seem to reveal that they were mostly using three cartridges in their handguns, 320, 380, and 450. 
So it's likely any number fives purchased would have been used with the 450 Adams cartridge. Number fives have also turned up with the uh, marking OVS on their grips. This likely indicates service with the Orange Free State or Orange uh, Free Staat in Dutch, which I don't speak. This little mark has created quite a bit of debate as well. It's commonly attributed to be a mark placed by the Lesotho government, formerly Bastoland. It's often used to recognize pieces which came out of South Africa, presumably by being sold or turned over to Bastoland at some point. Personally, again, I have no primary documents on that marking, but it does turn up on pieces like, well, actually this one, which have known South African symbols. In this piece's case, it's marked CP along with an inventory number. This is likely in reference to the Cape Police, later known as the Cape Mounted Police. This paramilitary force in the service of the Cape Colony was established in 1882. They were generally used as a heavier police force for crime prevention and apprehension, but could also be deployed in the defense of the colony in times of war. Which of course did happen. The Cape Police were deployed for the Bekwanaland campaign during the 1896 Rinderpest academic. Uh, this was in order to enforce uh, orders to kill infected livestock which were being resisted by Botswana leaders. Uh, a much more costly use of the Cape Police came during the Boer War, where they were largely broken up to serve in British and Cape military formations, though some were also used for guarding prisoners of war. Following the Boer War, the Cape Police actually continued to operate even after the merging of the Cape Colony with the new Union of South Africa in 1910. It would be three more years before they were properly absorbed by the permanent force. Interestingly enough, this revolver also displays a post-1911 Union of South Africa marking in several places, making a likely survivor in service from the 1880s until at least 1913. And finally, a very rare and unusual model is known to have been sold to another unit in the Cape, the Cape Mounted Rifles, who had been formed in 1878 by the militarization of the Frontier Armed and Mounted Police. This was of course part of Bartley Frere's aggressive and expansionist reforming of the Cape Colony government, one in which he seized the reins in order to foster more armed action against the native peoples in a bid to grow their borders. Interestingly, it appears that the Cape Mounted Riflemen requested a single action only revolver, likely due to the concerns that we have repeatedly encountered on this show about negligent discharges with double actions on horseback. Just on the surface, the Cape Number no. 5 is an unusual revolver. The trigger guard is smaller, the grip plates are squared off at their tops, which by the way is a feature that has turned up on at least one Cape Police revolver. But the angle of the grip has uh, a distinctly sharper angle, and the grip frame is shorter, forcing Webley to cover the butt with a cap and a lanyard. Internally, this thing is kind of a nightmare because Webley's lock work was never meant to be single action. An extra thingy was needed to make the cylinder stop and cylinder bolt and the hand work correctly. From what I can tell of the layout, the trigger's pivot point was moved to the hole for the sear on a normal model. The trigger's hole in the frame is used for the weird thingy. I guess from the cult parlance, it might be called a saddle? Anyway, I think that has us wrapped up on as much as I can wrap my head around the number five new model Army Express with the examples I've been able to lay hands on. So let's take this normal one over to May and get her opinion on how it handles. Hello again, my old friend. Hello. Now, today we have the Webley number five, mm -hmm. new model, which weirdly, being the number five, sounds like a step forward, step back. New model sounds like a step forward, another step back. That's good. Uh, I'm frankly disappointed that I was unable to get a hold of an old model mm -hmm. Army Express because... Was that an actual step forward? Yes, actually, the old model Army Express had an Abadie gate-loading system. Well, there we go. That's a huge improvement uh, right there. Just on it. It had an automatic rebounding hammer. Oh, shit. Yeah. This, neither. No. Mm -mm. It really doesn't have it. So, uh, I'd be very curious to see one of those if anybody has one to take loan of, but they are an odd duck, and frankly, I can't find any proof of them going into military service other than... Uh, no, no, not those. Only the new models went into. The old models, I don't know of any military service from those. Okay. Uh, I'd like to be proven wrong because, again, this is an episode that could get touched up one day. So, let me give you this. Thank you. And can you give me some first impressions? Well, 
it actually kind of looks cool. It looks to be in decent condition from the outside. However, okay, they look rad as crap. I'm sorry. They do. However, I know this one in particular, you had to do a bit of work on this one, right? Okay. To get it running? <laughs> the, the actual guts for this revolver are in the other room. Mm-hmm. Those guts came out of, uh, thank you, Brandon, for digging up yet another weird parts gun for me. Thank you, Brandon. A nickel number five that had had its arbor completely r removed and then somebody made their own, but they screwed through the frame and they really messed that gun so up. So internally, there's been some some work to restore this one then. That one's had a totally rebuilt lock work so that it could work at all because the original lock work was so far out of time that I'm honestly kind of convinced that it had been rebuilt by... The South African Army. Mm -hmm. um, the markings on this one have mostly been scrubbed off by re-bluing process. I really suspect that this gun actually was very heavily monkeyed with at some point in its history. So mm -hmm. it's a, an internal total rebuild in order to get it operational for the show. Okay. Um, but it, it does work. It did run. Yes. You're not wrong. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's just go from the top then. So... Uh, it looks kind of hanky in some ways in that um, I've got a bird's head grip. I've got a barrel that looks like it kind of is tilted. Am I crazy? Or is it, like <laughs> it does kinda... have a little bit of a weird bias. Yeah, it looks like it's going into the frame in a weird angle that doesn't really make any sense. Like it looks like it's kind of going up and out. Mm -hmm. Why? I, I get, oh, I get it. They're just trying to really stick up the front side. Yep. Okay, cool. Makes sense. It still looks weird. I even looked at this whenever we did the picture. It's because the, the, the bore is not completely concentric to the barrel. Yeah. I thought somebody, we, uh, some, one of us had cut the gun out improperly in Photoshop and went, oh no. <laughs> so we hit the so skew. I pulled up the original ones and went, no, this is just what this looks like. Yeah, that's Okay, fair. cool. Uh, absolutely bizarre. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there's just a lot of shapes that just don't make sense with this one. And I'm not happy with the bird's head grip. However... This one actually feels kind of good. Is it? Yeah, it's surprising. Where's the knuckle at for you, though? Is it really doing oh, anything? Oh, no, I'm, the knuckle does shit. <laughs> I don't know why these British revolvers, the knuckles never seem to be where they're supposed to be. Does it make any sense? Were they? Why did they do them that way? Was it for a glove purpose, or was it just I'm because I'm still, from the draw? I have yet to have anybody explain it to me. Maybe from the draw, it's actually comfortable. They either were holding them at a much more aggressive angle and low like this. Yeah, I mean, for point shooting at the hip. But Maybe. old target shooting was here, so that's even worse. Yeah. And I wonder if it's almost like you know, what you said, where maybe they were worried about being able to draw and being able to point, and they would just choke up for the point. But it's... It just doesn't make any sense. It ends up with a very aggressively raked hand motion that doesn't fit well Right, to me. and makes a trigger pull very awkward, I would yeah. argue. Um, I'm surprised you haven't commented on the weight. Well, the weight is actually insanely dense. I'm yeah. sorry. My brain uh, started thinking on the things that just don't make sense because looks wise, it's just, it's an odd duck in general. But weight wise, right. you're not wrong. This is incredibly dense feeling. It feels. There's, coming off the other RICs, coming off comparable firearms. I mean, this is a Tranter 1878. Right. This Again, triple action, single loading, eject. These two competed with each other. And then they also competed with this, the Colt 1878. I mean, the Tranter looks larger. It feels like the weight's the same. Right. The Tranter's significantly larger in dimensions, huh. and yet the weight is almost spot on between the two of them. You're not wrong. That weight it does feel dang near identical. I almost feel like the Tranter feels lighter to me, actually. And then the Colt 1878, which is a fairly dense gun, again... It definitely is heavier. The Colt is heavier. Yeah, but not by not much. Not by much, And though. that's a notoriously heavy gun. That's really weird. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. What all is that weight? I guess it's just in the just actual frame. frame. Yeah. That is the only thing that makes sense. They bulk the crap. I mean, look how thick the frame is between the grips. Oh, yeah. You're not wrong. That is incredibly yeah. thick. It's hint of grip with Were mostly frame. Were they really frame. worried about um, structural damage? I wish, I wish I knew. I wish I knew what spawned it because it's very clear that this is a reaction to a problem that they had. I don't know if somebody trialed the old model mm -hmm. and then they this caused them to go bananas on this one, but... This is clearly an over-response to something. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. I mean, it does if you think about your customer. Your customer is somebody that's like, I want old steel and I want it to be solid. And right. so they just make it into a brick and they go, yeah, this is the one I want. It's solid. And then obviously we are a gate loader, which unfortunately isn't really the best gate loader. Because usually, so I'm thinking like, 
Like what we talking about with the Colt and with the Tranter. So the Tranter follows a tradition from the Adams, I believe, where if you roll past the click. Yep, you roll past click, the click. And then you back. roll the cylinder back a little bit. It should line up the port for you loading of the cartridge. Yeah, my 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 scallop the and my cartridge, my next cartridge position. It should be perfectly lined. Perfect. Yeah. This one. No, exactly it just in the rolls wrong spot. back and it literally covers it. There's no way you can't even load the next one in it. it could, they honestly they could have accidentally over traveled it where you could roll it back mm -hmm. just a little too far. That'd have been better because then it would have lined up at least the one after it. Right now the Colt does the same thing because we found this in Von Alpen's letters. Mm -hmm. Von Alpen told Colt, "Hey man, you gotta at least make it do this because this makes it easier to load in the dark. It makes it right. easier to know what you're doing. That you're fumbling." Yeah, you're definitely fumbling. You just have to know the position. Um, that's a bit annoying, actually. Um, the ejector rod, uh, spring assisted. I didn't really see anything remarkable about it, but it was actually pretty good. It tucks away, which is kind of nice on the fly. So you can use that pretty steadily. Um, now, there's no real key difference between that ejector rod and the one on the Colt, other than it does sort of, I mean, they both sort of do the rocking into place, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the Tranter 1878... We had problems with this one because it actually fell loose and jammed up the edge. Right, there's no spring to kind of tension that one. I mean, there is, but it's a little flimsy flat that wore out, and it allowed it to just sort of bop. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, not only that, but there's no spring pushing spring the forward. forward. Even if it at least had just held it forward, even if it felt flopped down, right. wouldn't have been a big problem. The only <laughs> problem was, was that when it finally fell back into the action. Right, it could just, there's nothing stopping it from going back and locking up the whole gun. Right. Yeah. Whereas this one, no, it's captive. Okay. Cool. Great. Um, otherwise, that's pretty much it just for looks alone on this guy. Yeah. yeah so difficult, so. Uh, heavy, a little awkward, yep. difficult to load because you have to index manually the whole time. Yep. As a matter of fact, it, and in, then you really it self have to, indexes to the worst position. Right. So then you have to sit here and you have to basically manually hold the cylinder in the right placement in what, order for you to load them in. What a really strange position to be in when you had started with essentially an Abity. Mm -hmm. How, I don't know if there was a patent lawsuit or extreme cost cuttings that caused this. I am not sure either. But it's really weird to me. Mm -hmm. All right, so we load her up with what is effectively a, I believe we used 455 in this gun's condition. Yep. Which is probably a little inaccurate. I actually believe 450 was more common down in uh, South Africa and the Cape, but it's hard to say mm -hmm. because the Cape was a British colony, so they might have gotten the updated ammo. But anyway, we use 455. Yep. Uh, it's capable of 455, 450, or 476, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it actually shoot? Lining up our sights, uh, this is feeling very um, number four. <laughs> they, they don't really soft. look any different from the number four, realistically. The V-notch is still kind of wide set and shallow. The front, I mean, the front side, I think, on the number four is slightly taller, but that might just be because this one might have just had a little bit of wear on the top because it does look a little shiny on top. Okay. So not remarkable, unfortunately, and not that great for fine shooting. Mm -mm. Better for short distance. Okay. Um, single action on this one, hammer pull is pretty heavy, and unfortunately, you're having to crawl up the bird's head grip in order to grab it. There's nothing really here to help you with that leverage point. Mm -mm. And I remember having difficulty with that on range, it's the, unfortunately. It's kind of like the disadvantage of a knuckle gun without the advantage. It's kind of odd. Yeah, it, it it fights you in order to for you to get crawl up. Mm -hmm. And then the actual trigger pull, single action, it's a little bit mushy, not okay. really much travel to it though. So it's it's right there on the cliff, which okay. is fine. Not a lot of weight to it. Double action, um, pretty heavy. Or heavy but even all the way through, I would okay. say. That's not bad. Okay. That's not, still doable? Yeah, still doable. Easy to keep on target? Not when they're well no, this was kind of more moderate than heavy, I guess I would say. <laughs> yeah okay more moderate than heavy i guess okay. i'd say but still not gr not easy to keep on target not not as easy as i would argue the number four was how is recoil stout um but i think not as stout as i remember as i expected it to be it probably caused some of that weight helped to bring it down i would right. argue um i guess i put it somewhere in the middle around I, i'd like it, it was uh, more on the lighter <laughs> side of moderate does that make sense sure it's what you'd expect from a four five five yes Pretty much. But not horrible. No, not not the worst it could have been. At least some of that weight did actually come back to help me out. Given so the, that's good. Given the size of this handgun, I was surprised that the recoil wasn't 
worse because I think of it as being just a, it is a big gun, but it yeah. is a little compact for a 455 to mm-hmm. my mind. And no, the weight really does eat it up. It does yeah, a pretty good job. It helps. Time. It really does. Um, that's pretty much it for shooting though. There wasn't anything exceptionally remarkable about it other than the fact that like everything else that was going that day, it kind of really wasn't shooting the, it, it, it had some hinky parts to it where just yeah. every once in a while the, the hand wouldn't settle well against the cylinder or something it would cause a little bit of a tie up. But again, we that's us that, rebuilding the lock work. Right. So we knew it wasn't going to be perfect. It took a couple passes to get this one to run perfect. Right. But as it originally was not dogged out like this example, probably fairly reliable actually. Mm-hmm. God, I wish we had an automatically rebounding hammer, though. That really is annoying that you have to manually do that. There's not a lot of gate loaders that have auto rebounding hammers, though. Really? So not, that especially does not back it. then. Well, actually, comparable to these guys, you know, if you're talking about 78 on these two, a little bit later for that, because that's the new model, not the original model. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd be really comparing it to your favorite of that year. Yeah. Um, Swiss 1878. Oh, yeah, okay. That's a rebounder using a Warnet lock work. That is, well, worn it. So you're saying it's doable. They just screwed up. <laughs> I'm saying the Swiss were ahead of the game. Okay. Because I'm assuming you would choose the Swiss over all of these. Um. Yeah, no, I can't see. N- Actually, that's a really good one to bring up for the time frame. Uh, yeah, no, the Swiss definitely would win out between all of them. No. Right. But with what's here, let's talk about who our winner is then. Because these guys were in direct competition with each other. Mm. Now, on instinct, where are you going? Pure instinct. So here's the thing. My heart always wants to pick the Tranter because mm. objectively it just looks... It's gorgeous. It feels a little lighter than the others. Yep. It's, and it's not a bad recoil and everything like that. Mm-hmm. However, I'd have to probably go with the Colt just because the Tranter tied up on me. The grip, honestly, was slightly more awkward, weirdly, on the Tranter. I was right. not expecting that. Awkward grip locked itself out. Yeah. Boom, failure. Yeah, that's just not going to work for me. Okay, and on then the between, Webley. If that rules that, it went out automatically. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then between the Webley and the Colt, well, the Colt actually just functioned well. Okay. And then decent cartridge, 45, although 455, not too bad. For comparison. Right. Um, and then, honestly, the cylinder on the Colt lines up way better. Yeah. The, the trigger Colt, pull is nicer. I hate to say it because we made fun of the Colt 1878. Yeah. Um, I think it wins pretty handily for a number of reasons. The grip is much more approachable than the other two in my mind. It's weirder that it is because it is still an awkward grip in and of itself. If it were just it on its own, oh, yeah, no, there are tons of problems. But comparing all three... That bird's head grip is technically the better most of Most usable. All. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not that any of them are spectacular, but that's the no. most usable in a lot of ways. Right. The other thing that we don't think about is how feature-rich the Colt is, because we kind of laugh it off, but uh, not being a top rig, ooh, okay. Mm-hmm. In terms of being a gate loader, the Webley doesn't have the over and index back. These Correct. two do. Okay, so, good. Good. Neither the Webley nor the Tranter have a lockout for the cylinder when it's in the holster or essentially not being shot, right? Right. The Colt, in its rebounded position, does if it's in correct time. See how it flicked to one position and stayed? Yes. It will stay there if it's correctly timed. Now, a lot of these will roll now that they're 100 and something years old. Sure, out of time. That's incorrect. You're supposed to have to go to the half cock position in order to then roll the cylinder properly. Okay. So... The other thing is, these guys have friction sprags. The Colt has an actual, well, at least this iteration of it, has a sprag that's set into the gate, which is a tipping lock over. Mm-hmm. So a slightly better sprag system. The one true problem with the Colt compared to these guys is that it falls out of time the easiest. It actually has a lock work that's not dissimilar from either of these. These all are using Tranter derivative lock works. Sure. And this lock work tends to be, I think, the most fragile. I almost always see these out of time. But then again, it's also the American collector's market. They Was might it have just heavy them. use? Yeah, that's right, what I'm that's thinking. The they might just be heavy use. Uh, I've brought all three of these lock works into time before. I've certainly did extensive rebuilding on this one. This guy was all parts when I got him with a hand cut hand that I did. Mm-hmm. This one required very little work, but I'm at least familiar with it. I will still say that it's probably the easiest to work on the Webley out of the three, okay. if they fall out of time, but none of them are spectacular. Right, so, because it's the cascading effect of the system. Right, right. So, uh, and the multi-threadedness of yes. it, like multiple things have to happen at once. 
So I'm kind of with you. Uh, we finally made it through the big three, quote unquote, British choices in the solid frames. Mm -hmm. I think I'm choosing the web, or I think I'm choosing the cult. Hey, at least that means the Brits are getting 45. <laughs> now, out of all of these, uh -huh. would you take any of them over the, we, I think we covered this, the Swiss 78? No. Oh, well, yeah. All of them go over the Swiss. Can you no, think of seeing. anything you prefer to the Swiss 78 that's a solid frame gate loader? Although it doesn't even have a gate. I can't think of what would even with a Swiss for that time. Um, I can't think of one. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't either. No. The only one I can think of would be like the Abadie. Oh, well, I mean, obviously. Because the Abadie yeah, came Abbey out system. in 1878. Yeah. So you would get the Abadie system. Objectively, that is superior. However, the Abadie was a small bore black powder. Right. Which is a little... I like smokeless small bore. <laughs> I like black powder big bore, you know, uh -huh. as a man stopper. There is, in theory, a Abadie that was in 11 millimeter French. Right. We've handled one. Um, we didn't get to shoot it for the show. That was on loan from a friend and... Uh, I know, up, from actually, it actually resold to somebody. It resold to somebody that watches this show, so maybe we will borrow it back one day. Yeah, but the but that was College Hill Arsenal that lent that to us. Right? Yes, it was Tim Prince of College yeah. Hill Arsenal. Um, so what I'm thinking is maybe that Big Bore Abity would be the king of the solid frame gate loaders, mm -hmm. but I don't know. We'd have to try it. Yeah, we'll have to get one to shoot now. You know who you are. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's got us covered for this episode. I yet think so. Yet again, I have to thank my friend Brandon for turning up the parts I need in order to get it done. So, yep. Brandon, you get the shout out this Thanks, time. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> and there is no executive producer for this episode, but inquire if you are curious. We do have a couple stacked up, just just one or two, mm -hmm. but they've they've got their names on other episodes. I think episodes. we already have our first 1911 coming up. Yeah, he was surprised nobody had put on the 1911 yet. So, inquire if you'd like the executive producership on that. I'm going to allow up to three slots on this. Yep. So, um, I think that's kind of covered. I think so. All right. Well, y'all have a good one, and yeah. we'll catch you next Thank time. Thank you, patrons, for the support. We appreciate y'all. Whoops. Additional thanks is definitely due to our friends Jonathan Ferguson and Christian Wellard over at the Royal Armories. Because of our British kick of both Webleys and Martinis, we've been badgering the pair of them for quick double checks and even photographs of specific pieces. Make sure to check them out yourself over at the Royal Armories YouTube channel. Yeah, it was just the rebrand. It still cracks me up, by the way. If I had a car dealership, I would unironically call it Big Truck. You'd better have big trucks. Yeah. What if you didn't have big trucks and that was what your like, dealership was? Come try your luck down at Big Truck. <laughs> You'll never guess what we have in stock. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> it's a truck and it might be big. <laughs> My cousin owns a place in Britain. It's called Large Lorries. <laughs> uh, if you have an early Colt 1911, that's Colt. And you're willing to let us borrow it to show no, not or a, just not, not or a shoot? Yeah, what are yeah, we doing? shoot and show. Okay, shoot and, yeah, shoot and show. Yeah, shoot and show. Look, some people only want to, you to touch it and kiss it, but they don't want you to shoot it. Wave one of this consideration, by the way, and I know I'm being choosy beggar, but I think I can be. There's enough of them out there. Mm -hmm. World War One features. Okay. Not a later slide, not reparkerized later, not re like, So no replacement parts on it either. <sighs> As few as humanly possible. You know what I mean? Okay. The big one is I think a lot of the barrels don't end up being original. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the stamping on the barrel is the biggest thing in the world as long as it's the right finish. You mm -hmm. guys get the idea. So keep an eye out. <laughs> if anyone has one to let us borrow for a shoot and show, please and thank you. We would love it. And so I look and as I'm, I'm lunging towards the dog, cooing, going, to the baby, you're on fire. <laughs> and Suze hears this from the other room because she... <laughs> Just let the candle is coming back, uh -huh. right? And then she hears bat, 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 because I get a hold of the dog. I'm smacking her out, right? Oh, right. And no, the dog's just like, the dog's this like, is different, is but I'm not right. Yeah. So then Suze, Suze's version of it's great because she goes, and then I just smelled burnt hair, and I went, oh, my God, the dog was on fire. <laughs> right now, we have a hammer resting on a sear in the rebounded position. We could go all the way to full cock. We're set right there on the sear again. The sear can be tripped by that little... Uh, trigger horn extension at the bottom of the trigger or rear of the trigger rather it's going to trip it 
It's gonna fall. There's your single action. This horn 